From the Homestead Studios in Santa Clarita, California, it's just a tip. Stirs with Melissa Morgan. In my humble opinion. If you got a tip for Melissa, a lie someone told you for no apparent reason, an urban legend you know to have more than one grain of truth, why watching your dog eating peanut butter never ceases to be hilarious. Tell us about it by calling the Tipster hotline at 832-TIPSTER. That's 832-847-7837 or send an email to jttipsters at gmail.com. You just might hear your tip on the podcast. Now here's your host. If she tells you she wants to bury the hatchet with you, it's recommended that you wear a reinforced safety helmet. Melissa Morgan. More cowbell. So you're saying I shouldn't mention that was the third take of the intro? <laughs> we're having a little uh, <laughs> we're having a little brain fart session over here with producer Mark today. Apparently, <laughs> somebody has fallen off the wagon. Oh my god! And just we have recorded. This is the third <laughs> intro, and he finally was like, um, "I I wasn't recording, I wasn't even recording. any of that." <laughs> We, so anyway, we fucked up two intros, and then I realized we uh, were recording. Me. Who's we, Kimosabi? I fucked what up. What you two meant intros. was you, that, you, and it wasn't even Jacques. Yeah, right. Jacques, you fucked up the intros. Uh, so anyway, oh god, I didn't know you. Off to a roaring start. Spoke French. That was impressive. I do. Yeah. Jacques yeah. and you know, it's French funny. dressing. The only. <laughs> And French fries. I can say French fries. It's funny that that I know that movie. I saw that movie with Better a, Off Dead. Oh my God! No, J'accuse. Oh, <laughs> which Sorry. which is a, a yeah. French art. You fell movie. asleep. You told me you fell asleep. I you fell said you asleep. went with a date. I went with a date, and <laughs> and then about you know all of a sudden I'm I'm re- I'm watching this horribly boring movie, and I'm next thing I know I'm being poked because you're snoring by my girlfriend at the time who is like. Outra- outraged at well, me yeah, because I, I was blame her. I was snoring. Yeah, <laughs> and way just annoying the entire theater because uh, I snore loudly when I'm sitting up. But oh, I hadn't thought. No, you really don't. Oh, I well, I did then. Oh, okay. It was apparently uh, like echoing off the walls in the oh, movie. Oh my theater. god, that's hilarious. Okay, well now we know yeah. what a classy, what a classy, classy bitch you are. Yes, I am. Yeah, if and how many times else. it takes to do an intro. Welcome to Just the Tipsters, where we are professional broadcasters who just can barely hold it together right now. I think we're actually doing pretty good, considering, you know, everything that our dog eats peanut butter. And I mean, it's just life is just, you know. Oh, it is. She is cute when she eats peanut butter. Yeah. The thing I love about most dogs when they eat peanut butter is that they want it really bad. And then when you give it to them. They sit up like and have this confused look on their face, and they had they just they sit and they just like move their, <laughs> they move their mouth and their tongue like what have I just done? Yeah, they're they're figuring out the conundrum of it's it's the texture it's stuck to the roof. That's the that you know what you've actually hit on something. I was always that weird kid that um, during like school field trips when your mom had to pack your lunch, I would have a salami sandwich. And everyone else would have peanut butter and jelly, which I never, I couldn't stand Me either. God, the I can't, idea. I cannot stand a peanut butter and jelly. But I, I get now, since I was a child, obviously, I've been a control freak because I love peanut butter everything else. Peanut butter candy, peanut butter ice cream, the smell of it. I mean, I love peanut butter. I love peanuts. Can't stand the consistency. And it's because I'm a control freak and I don't want shit stuck to the roof of my mouth. Is that right? Yes. So you have a lot in common with our... Our, our little, little doggy, Siren. Yeah, yeah. yeah, so Siren Marie uh, Morgan Humphreys is a crazy bitch dog, but she's getting better. She's getting, um, I think, more comfortable with um, our weird routines around here. And I've been reading up on, I guess it's been about eight weeks now we've uh, we've had her in our home. been reading up on um, the Belgian Malinois and uh, why they are such a good dog for law enforcement apparently a lot of law enforcement agencies are phasing out it's it's and it's a terrible answer i'm going to tell you in my mind phasing out german shepherds uh because belgian malinois are are typically a small smaller in size so i read uh a question that someone posed to law enforcement why are rottweilers not used in law enforcement as you know uh, drug sniffing dogs etc and the answer was awful and shocking. Um, 
And he explained that they were phasing out German Shepherds and bringing in Belgian Malinois that look a lot like German Shepherds, just with shorter hair, but they're typically smaller framed. Uh, A dog handler and a dog, uh, a law enforcement dog handler and a dog are a, in their, in his words, a bonded pair. And if something were to happen to the law enforcement person, the dog handler, a dog wouldn't even let anyone get near them, including rescue personnel. So one of the things for uh, being a dog handler in the law enforcement agency is that you have to be able to choke out a dog to get them to pass out. Uh Uh-huh. And if you're holding, uh, you you take their choke chain and you hold them up uh, uh, up in the air until they pass out. And, and, and this, and this police officer is like, and, and there's no permanent damage. And I'm thinking, yeah, I'm not sure I'm buying that, but, uh, Rottweilers have very strong, strong neck muscles and they couldn't possibly, you know, it, it would take a lot to choke out a Rottweiler, I would imagine. Uh, and German shepherds can weigh, you know, 130, 140 Belgian Malinois, typically, you know, 70 to hundred, depending on if they're male or female. So I didn't like the answer at all. But so let, let me see if I understand this. So they they become bonded to their police officer partner. Handler, yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And they won't let anybody near that handler, even if the handler needs assistance. Yes. Oh, I see. So I get it. So you need a dog that's smaller and, and easier to choke out. <laughs> I mean, everything Wowie. I know, it was just a terrible answer and I didn't like it at all, but it might be true. But I do know everything I look up about the, about the Belgian Malinois is that a female Belgian Malinois was used to to find Osama bin Laden. And I'm like, look, you know, SEAL Team 6 <laughs> found Osama bin Laden. And a lot, it took, it took a village. A lot of people found Osama bin Laden. The female Belgian Malinois sniffed he and his family out in their, you know, hidey hole or whatever. But I don't, uh, you can't say that a female Belgian Malinois found, it's not like a female Belgian Malinois sitting in a, in the war room typing on a computer you know what i think he's here you know i mean they (laughs) they they do great work but they need help and they need a handler anyway that's a very Uh, bizarre i think we ought to come in from the southeast (laughs) yeah and can you uh i need new flea meds can you get me some new flea meds i'm scratching yeah if i I get enough flea meds for another 90 days i think i'll be good (laughs) on the mission yeah right it's a little odd so well but she was part of the team come on yes of course i'm just saying that it wasn't like they they made it it's like she found him i'm like okay she's a good good girl um anyway we are not allowed to give a shout out to the person who sent us these amazing tumblers but we're doing it anyway we're not going to say their name per their instructions but i just have to tell you these two tumblers that we received yesterday are spectacular they really are (laughs) mine mine says bloodstains are red ultraviolet lights are blue i'll i watch enough murder shows they'll never find you and then on the other side (laughs) it says more cowbell it is the most spectacular personalized tumbler in the universe and producer mark got one that says producer mark and a really cool old school what are those silver microphones called sweetheart you know i i don't know what they're i don't know the name of it but it looks fantastic it's beautiful and then on the other side it's a it's a board um a sound board like like producer mark has with the slides and i mean they're just works of art so yeah, it's really cool thank you yeah we mystery we can't, person we, we can't, can't say your name yeah. <laughs> but we love you and thank you and are very grateful because i love having these tumblers made as gifts for other people it's just so amazing to have the tables turned and get one as a gift yourself. So I'm just, we're really, really blessed and grateful to have possibly the best listeners of any podcast in the universe. The other piece of information that came out this week that I was so delighted about, besides the fact that yesterday was the two-year anniversary of Joseph James D'Angelo being identified and arrested, uh, we, we had pot roast for dinner and, and memory of, of that wonderful day. I'll never forget that day. I was uh, not sleeping. And about 4 a.m., I happened to look at my phone, and there's a flurry of activity saying, you know, the Golden State Killer was arrested. And I'm like, oh, they're full of shit. And then a few hours later, it's like, they're fucking right. So I was so excited about that. We had pot roast for dinner. Um, it's just so, But it you was, need to say what the significance of the pot roast oh, is. Oh, the last thing he said is, as uh, the officers were arresting him in front of his home in Citrus Heights was, but I have a pot roast in the oven. And then said nothing else. That was what, that's another thing that's so fascinating is that that's the only thing he said. 
And the uh, officers were like, we'll take care of that for you. They went in, turned off the stove, and uh, took him. And he was in the Sacramento County Jail, and he sat for an hour and didn't move. The only thing I can compare it to is from the movie Psycho, the the second one. I don't know if it was called Psycho 2 or... It was. Okay. Or no, or was it the first one? The first one, he's sitting in the cell... It, I think that's the first it one. It was the first one. You're right. I'm sorry. It was the first one. And he's sitting in his in a inter, interview room and he's talking about a fly movie. He's like not moving. It's, it was very reminiscent of Joseph James D'Angelo. Oh, you know, that might have been Psycho 2 because I think on Psycho 1. Oh, it, he it, doesn't get arrested. No, he gets, no, it's two. he gets arrested, I think. But you hear him in the in the other room w- talking, talking as his mom. As his mom. Yeah. Back in, yeah I can't remember right. which one it was now. I think it's the second. Anyway. Let's just say it was Tony Perkins and it was well done. It was Tony Perkins and he is in an interview room and, and he's not moving, but yet he's talking as two people. That very much reminds me of Joseph James D'Angelo, when you hear uh, my beloved Paul Holes discussing looking at him through two-way mirror or two, two-way two window, he's he doesn't move. He doesn't move and he doesn't talk. He doesn't say anything. He doesn't say anything to anyone, Doesn't and he hasn't spoken since, you know, except a couple of grunts to his, you know, court-appointed attorneys or whatever. But yeah, it's pretty interesting stuff. It's been two years he's been, you know, in, in jail waiting as the horrible wheels of justice turn very slowly. But in a similar vein, the same wonderful process that found him, genetic genealogy, has found another man. And this might be one of the oldest cases. And hopefully he's still alive. They have put out uh, a warrant for him and are looking for him. They don't know where he is. He would be 81 years old by now. But it's a case from August of 1963. A beautiful girl, Peggy Beck, in Colorado was a camp counselor and she was so excited for this job and it was her last day of being a camp counselor and she was strangled and assaulted in her tent in the middle of the night and they finally with all of this amazing genetic investigation it is spectacular they have put out a arrest warrant for James Redmond Taylor and he was in his 20s at the time in Colorado. The last place they have, you know, uh, traced him to is in Las Vegas in 1976. And they have no idea where he is now. He still has family members that are alive. That's probably how they caught him <laughs> with with genealogy. And it's... So they had DNA from that far back that they could load into the system? Apparently they did. Unbelievable. Unbelievable, isn't it? Yeah, I that's mean, 56 incredible. years, 57 years ago. I mean, just wow. Yeah, uh, uh, you know, and he's he's you know an 81 year old man now. Hopefully, or you know, probably he might be gone. You never know, but you know, they haven't found any any death records. That's why they're you know they don't know where he is now. We're looking for him, and I'm I'm you know excited, and I hope they find him. Doesn't here the only thing I can say is that hey assholes, we're coming for you. And that's one of those things that leads into this week's episode. You know, assholes, we're coming for you. And it's been 22 years since this case, and we are still looking for help. I was unimpressed with the McCrary County Sheriff's Office and their lack of um, cooperation. (laughs) Let's just say that. Phone calls and emails, uh, basically, you know, if if they'd have told me to go pound sand, that would have been an answer, but it didn't even get that. So I was pretty unhappy with that. But we do have a an interview with a family member. This beautiful girl, Crystal Marler, was 15. And I mean, she is exquisitely beautiful. And she just disappeared. They don't exactly know if it was from her home. It seems like it because she had made it home from a friend's house and had written in her diary. So she had made it home at some point. Whether she went out again or someone came and picked her up, she you know, obviously didn't drive. So someone came and picked her up and they walked away or someone came and picked her up and they took her away in a vehicle. We don't know. But her remains were found 11 years later and she had been bludgeoned and shot. And there was other evidence found. And you know, here we are 11 years after that and nothing and nothing. This is McCrary County is in Kentucky, right? Yes, southeastern part of Kentucky. 
And this case came to me from a school friend that we didn't graduate together because we'd only gone to junior high together. And she and her family had moved from Northern Kentucky down to Southeastern Kentucky where her father was from. And she, you know, I don't know how she found the podcast. I haven't even asked her, but she sent me an email. And this case was so interesting to me. And the more I dug and dug, and obviously small towns, a lot of rumors, there's a lot of small town gossip and none of it, you know, means anything unless someone out there says, you know what? I know this. I heard this. I saw this. I really, I really am, am asking if anyone knows anything about this case and we'll leave the, the number for the McCreary County Sheriff's at the, at the end of the episode to, to really consider calling in, you know, Lorella is 85. And as she says, you know, none of us live forever. And she wants to know who and why, who did this to her granddaughter and why before she goes to meet them again. Uh, Crystal's mother died in a terrible accident two years before Crystal's remains were found. It's, there's just, this family has had enough. They've been through enough and they need answers. And I'm going to ask this, and I don't know that I've ever asked this, but if there's a private investigator anywhere in, you know, the southeastern part of Kentucky, Tennessee, any anywhere around there, and you have some time that you would like to work on a case, I'm asking for your help. And I know Lorella needs your help. And this case needs your help. Crystal needs your help because she, I mean, just such a beautiful girl. Lorella describes her as having big dreams and you can see it when you see pictures and especially a 22 year old picture, you're never sure what a picture is going to look like. And it, in a flat one dimensional form never shows someone in, in their life, how they move and act and behave. But Crystal's picture is different. She looks almost three dimensional in a flat picture. She looks like she's about to come out of a picture and just start moving and living and breathing. You can just, she's so full of life and light. You can just see the light coming out of this beautiful girl's eyes. And whatever happened, she sure didn't deserve that. No one deserves that, but she really didn't deserve that. So if you're a private investigator and you want to work on this case, if you happen to live in the area and know something that you weren't even sure you knew, but now you know is the truth and you want to tell someone, please call the McCreary County Sheriff's Office. And again, we'll leave that number. Please feel free to call us at 832-847-7837, our tipster hotline. You can email us, jttipsters at gmail.com. We want to hear from you. And here is the case of Crystal Marler. So today we have a special guest. We have Lorella Woods, who is the grandmother of Crystal Marler. And Crystal's case was sent to me by a friend from um, junior high school back in northern Kentucky. And tipster Lisa had moved to where uh, Lorella and her mother and Crystal had had lived. Uh, Crystal's mother had lived in McCrary County, um, Kentucky. And Crystal's case was, um, it's unsolved, and it was a mystery, even a bigger mystery for, for quite a few years. Crystal went missing at the age of 15 in October of 1998 and was found in 2009, um, 11 years after she went missing by, her remains were found by hunters. And it took um, a detective and I guess the then uh, McCrary County Sheriff to finally uh, put Crystal's case under the umbrella of a homicide. She had been missing for 11 years, but her remains that were found there, there was evidence that it wasn't that she ran away and, you know, died in the woods. It was an actual homicide. So Lorella, tell us about your Crystal. Tell us about her. I probably can't talk for Christ. (laughs) I understand because I have to tell you 
Her pictures are so incredibly beautiful. That girl was just, I just gorgeous. And the pictures today, you know, 22 years, almost 22 years later, she still looks so vibrant. I mean, her pictures just look like they talk to you off the page. She must have been a very special girl. She was from, I don't think I saw her until she was a couple of years old, maybe. But uh, she was pretty she could be. And when she got a little older, she was real active and, and uh, just wanted everything. We went to Dollywood one year, and she wanted to buy that whole town. <laughs> <laughs> Turn it to Crystal Land? <laughs> yeah. Dolly, Dolly, were a crystal world. <laughs> she had big dreams. Uh-huh. She was a beautiful girl, so beautiful. So, she was on her way to visit with some friends. Is that what happened in October of 1998? Yes, her mother had taken her to the library and got a book or something. Her mother worked nights, and Crystal wanted to go down to a friend to get some. Um, CDs or DVDs or whatever it was, uh, maybe even tapes, that they had borrowed from her, I believe is the way it was. And um, so her mother just dropped her off down there, and then her mother came on over over here and stayed until time to go to work. She worked right up the road here from me at a nursing home. Right. And then what happened? Was someone supposed to pick Crystal up, or she was supposed to be with her friends? It wasn't very far from her house. She could have walked. Oh, I see. And when did Crystal's mother, Abigail, find out that she had not made it home? Well, that was a Thursday night, I believe. And Friday, when Abby got home from work, she would have already been gone to school. And she didn't think much about it, but she didn't come home then that night. Right. So the next day, we... I found out about it and and went to the law and everything. And you, questioned some of her friends. Did anyone have any really good information or answers? No. No. Who was the last person who saw her? The friend that she went to pick up her her borrowed items from? Well, she had gone back home and wrote in her diary, her journal. She mm. had a composition book that she wrote in all the time about every day. Hmm. So she was back home that night. So we think somebody just called her up and came and got her. So she had made it back home. She had time to write in her journal. Yes. And then something happened and she is just never heard from again. Right. Poof, she's gone. And these, this is before the days of any sort of, um, you know, video activity. You know, we don't have, you know, we didn't have cameras everywhere. Um, I'm guessing in 1998, did, did she have a cell phone or was that not even no. on her radar? Yeah, she was a little young and wouldn't have needed one probably right then, that's for sure. Or didn't think she did. So there's no real way to track her. She wasn't, she didn't drive because she was too young to drive so someone else had to come and get her physically or come and pick her up in a vehicle of some sort and there was no reports from any neighbors of seeing her get into a car no nothing like that she's just she's just gone so abby comes home from work crystal should have been at school didn't think anything about it finds out she didn't go to school and that she's now gone. And there are no friends. There's no nothing. You know, girls can't not tell their friends <laughs> if they feel like there's, you know, a boy they like or or anything like that. And none of Crystal's friends came forward and said she might be with this person. No. Nothing. That would have to be the most frustrating thing in the world, that your child is just gone. Was the family happy with how law enforcement responded to her case? No, they just figured she was a runaway. 
that's what I hear way more than I ever want to hear. Yes. At the age of 15, they just think she ran away. And there was nothing besides the fact that Crystal was obviously beautiful and creative with big dreams. There was nothing in her behavior or nothing at home that would have made her want to run away. No. She had a good life. She had friends and people who loved her. What would she be running away from? I don't know. She she got kind of down and out lost after she was that old. That teenage kind of angst? Yeah. That happens with every teenager? When she was younger, everybody picked on her, thought she was pretty, she could be, you know, and everything. And One lady even wanted to take her home, keep her. Aw, she she really is so incredibly beautiful. I mean, just like I said, she still just, you know, jumps out at you from any picture that you take of her. She just, you can't you can't dim that inner light. She's just a big inner light. She's a beautiful girl. So, the you don't think the police really spent a lot of time tracking down anything, looking at potential suspects they just thought well she ran away they did kind of after a while and they questioned one family right and um, they were supposed the family was supposed to take him up to the state police was in the same building as the sheriff's office and they were supposed to take their son up there that day and then they called to they were going to do a lie detector test, I guess. Mm-hmm. But they called back and said they weren't coming. So there wasn't any way they could make him. Right. So you mentioned a specific family. So the digging around that I've done, there's a whole lot of finger pointing and innuendo on a specific family, particularly two brothers and another person uh, who would have been a friend, different last name. One of the brothers has since uh, died. Do you believe that either of the two brothers in that family or the other person who moved to Louisville after Crystal's remains were found, do you believe any of those men had anything to do with her disappearance? We did at first, and I don't know who the other person could have been that has moved to Louisville. I don't remember hearing that. I'll tell you his name later. <laughs> yeah, that's that's everything I have read points to those particular suspects. Um, and since one of them is deceased and the other one may not be, you know, that close geographically anymore, it must be tough when you have so little information to go on and and you can't really you feel like you're not ever going to get to the end of this. I can tell you, I reached out to McCreary County Sheriff's office and was surprised at the amount of pushback I got. Oh, (laughs) you're, you don't sound like you are surprised. No. Yeah. Uh, just didn't want to give me the time of day. And, um, I mean, real, just like put down a wall and made it difficult to even leave a message um, for anyone. And and that I find is very uh, unusual because they, uh, the, the present um, McCreary County Sheriff, Sheriff Waters, has put out quite a few things asking for tips, asking for help, saying it's still a very active case. And all we have are, you know, is gossip and rumors we do get tips occasionally, but if it's just, you know, someone someone telling a rumor they heard, it it's hard to track down. But then not being open when I call and say, would you like to talk about the case? And I explained that I would be talking to you and just not, not I got zero answer. Emails and phone calls. I got nothing back. But that doesn't sound like it's surprising to you. Not too much. Uh, you didn't talk to a lady over there? I did. Oh, did she tell you her name? No, she uh, was 
I don't, I'm going to say this and I hope she's not like your best friend or something. She was possibly the most rude woman I've ever spoken to in my life. <laughs> a friend of mine does work there. As a matter of fact, she's our treasurer in the historical society. But uh, oh, this, this wasn't the treasurer. I think this was just someone answering the phone. It was a public information person, right? I, she didn't give me her title or name. So I don't know if she, I don't know if they have a public information person in the sheriff's office in McCrary County, but she was really unpleasant. <laughs> and, I don't believe uh, my friends working there now. They're everybody's staying home. <laughs> right, exactly. Right. No, this was someone who answered the phone at the sheriff's office. Yeah, yes. and she was highly unpleasant. And yeah, so and I have and I contacted uh, Sheriff Waters uh, personally, and nothing. Not and not even a response. Like you know, I can't help you. Go pound sand. Turn green. Nothing. I got nothing. Just And I was like, okay, that's great. I have all these articles where you're begging people for tips and asking for help, but won't talk to anyone about the case. I mean, about anything. So take me back to 11 years after she disappears and remains are found by some hunters. Where, this service road where it turns out it was identified as Crystal's remains, how far away... Is that from the house she shared with with her mom, Abigail? Oh, maybe five miles. I'm I'm not real sure. Okay, so just not not far, but in the same kind of area. Is it an area that Crystal would have known about? I don't think so. Right. It seemed like uh, it was just off of a service road, and it seems like a place that wouldn't it wouldn't be a place for kids to hang. And it wouldn't be a place for her to go and run away, especially after finding out that she had apparently been bludgeoned and shot from the remains. That's how it was finally classified a homicide. They said she'd been shot through the mouth and in the back of the head. Right. And, and apparently bludgeoned, which seems like overkill. You don't need to do so much so i have to ask this because it has come up as a rumor is there any chance that this is because crystal was biracial i think so you do yes the fbi came here and they said they couldn't get into it unless it was a kidnapping or racial and i said well i think it was both interesting but they didn't do anything so the FBI showed up because she was a child. When a child goes missing, that's typically the FBI can be involved. But they they said unless she had been kidnapped or it was a, a hate crime, and you think it was both. Yes. So do you still believe it was the people that you thought it was, or do you believe it was somehow something else? Well, after we got her journal, I've got all the papers. Her mothers gave them all to me. I've got all of Abby's, too, since she passed away, or a lot of her stuff. Um, she had written, like on Wednesday night, she and a friend had gone out with these two guys. And they'd gone to Oneida, but it was pouring the rain. They were going to a ball game or something, but it was pouring the rain. But the guy that was with Crystal was an older married guy. And after all that, I thought he might have come back the next night and got her, but it was about 11 o'clock or so. So Oneida is a small is a small town near where you live, right? They'd gone? It's uh, in Tennessee, but it's just uh, six or seven miles from here. Across the border, right? Yes. And she was with an older married man yes and I you know, i don't know which one was the driver but i think they were in the back seat she and the other guy and you think he may have come back the following night because he was afraid she would tell his wife or i don't know okay I just thought maybe he came back or something so you have done more detective work than the detectives yes <laughs> far more yeah. The guy that was with him, he's in jail all the time, but this guy that was with her, 
he went back up Cincinnati to his dad's a few years later, and his dad shot and killed him right across the table. Wow. So two people that may have possibly been on a suspect list are deceased. Yes. And uh, the boys that you were talking about before, their dad died after the one boy died. Right. But there's died before. But there's still one family member left, at least. Two boys. Yeah. Okay. So there's still two boys left who may know what happened and have never been questioned. And when someone in their family, the one who is deceased, was supposed to be taken to the police station for a polygraph test, they called and said, we've changed our mind, we're not coming. Yes. The mother and father were separated, but he had called her at lunchtime or something like that. She didn't know it for a few days afterwards. Uh, I talked to her also. So the two boys that are still alive, have they ever been questioned? I don't think so. They stay in jail most of the time. (laughs) Well, let's let you know they're good quality human beings. Yeah, and the guy that was with, the guy she was with in the car the night before, he's in jail most of the time, too. And I've told him that they could bargain with him and make him tell if he knew anything about it, but they will they will do stuff like that. That that was a a good idea and that seems like that would be something that's where a lot of tips come from and unfortunately it's difficult to trust them when they come from people where you question their honesty. But maybe if they have sentences that they could get shortened, they would come forward and say something about who did this and why. I'm I'm kind of shocked that that hasn't been used as a tool to get information about Crystal's case. I think it would have helped. I think they could have, because all of them been in jail. Right. So another terrible part of this story is that Abigail was involved in an automobile accident a few years before Crystal's remains were found. So she didn't even know what happened to her daughter. We can hope that they they know now and they're together. But where was Abigail when the automobile accident happened? She was right at the end of our road up here. She was turning. It was on Friday and she was she didn't work till night, but she was going to the nursing home to get her paycheck, and she stopped to turn, and the car just ran and ran back. So she was stopped, and someone just plowed, plowed into her. Yes. And she died because of the accident, but the driver did not. No. He's a so-called preacher. He's a preacher. Oh, okay. I didn't know that part. And he's he's still alive, and he lived through the accident. Was he ever uh, charged with anything involving vehicular homicide, or they had a trial, but they didn't find him guilty. Oh, so he was okay. Was he drinking, or was that not? He bought drugs from people around here that I know, but I don't know if he used them or what. I see. So you don't know at the time of the accident if he was I don't know. inebriated. Okay, I gotcha. Okay. He just said he didn't remember anything from, it was not even a quarter of a mile from the red light to the road for the nursing home he is. He said he didn't remember anything after he left the red light, but he knew that she was there or something. The car was there. Wow. Wow. I, f- I feel like your family has had just about enough. <laughs> that just is, um, that's way too much insult to injury already. So it sounds like you have a lot of information about Crystal's case, and you have kept all of this information, and you're a very good gatekeeper, key master of all of this case. The friend that I 
I was telling you about that works in the sheriff's office said after the new district attorney for this area. Oh, okay. And uh, we've got a new one now, and she thought that he would do more. So there's a new DA, and your your friend in the sheriff's office says that she thinks the new DA will do more looking into the case. That's what she told me when he was running, and he got got the office, so... Well, I think that's at least a good start. Sometimes fresh eyes on a case can see something that maybe other people didn't, even though I know there's not a, sounds like a lot of investigation that happened in the early part of her going missing because that's the important time. Yes. I, I'm, I'm still a little shocked that when a 15 year old girl goes missing, they, they say she's a runaway. I'm still always shocked at that. And you know, obviously that does happen sometimes, but it it happens enough times that a situation like this is the result, and they need to pay attention faster to what's happening because those, you know, few precious days at the beginning, weeks at the beginning, when something like this happens, people are more likely to talk, to have the correct information, you know, time age, you know, all of that plays into your recollection as you get, as more time goes by, maybe people have, you know, the wrong memory. It's, it's such a heartbreaking thing for something to go this, this long without being solved, without something shaking loose. So when her remains were found, did that open up anything with the case? Did more people come forward? No, nobody came forward. They just talked about it. Right. There's definitely a lot of gossip online. <laughs> oh, yes. Yeah, about, about who did what and, and why. And I still never quite understood and got to what could be the motive. But you actually think it could have been because she was biracial? I kind of think so. Uh, some of them had started making remarks about it but she was she was still pretty i mean and she had friends the, the one that we thought did it at first he was a good friend of hers supposedly right and, uh, and so i figured if he was got with some other boys and they did did that convinced him to yeah. do something yeah you usually want to start close and then move out as far as because this doesn't sound like a stranger abduction like that she was walking down the street and someone picked her up. No. So even after her remains are found and it was proven she's not a runaway and it was proven that she came to an end that was at someone else's hand, it still didn't open up the case? No. That's very shocking to me. Well, they, they said it was never closed, but uh, right. they, they didn't do anything. That's what the sheriff said in, in all of the articles I've read is that it's still a very open, active case. But again, you know, couldn't really understand why no one wanted to talk or give any kind of a statement at all. So tell me, Lorella, what can someone do if they know any information about about Crystal's case? We will absolutely give the sheriff's number at the end of the podcast for people to call. But is there anything that anyone can do to help with this case? Just if anyone knows for sure. Like I said, the two brothers are, I don't even know where they're living. They were living in somebody's empty house or something. They finally got them out there, but I don't, I don't know if they would tell anything if they knew it. But other than that, I don't know who would. Well, like, you know, we know someone or someones know something. There is absolutely probably more than one person who knows what happened to Crystal in October of 1998. And we'll give the number for the Mercury County Sheriff's Office. Absolutely. Is there anything else you want listeners to know, Lorella? Her grandma, Abby's mom, is up here in the nursing home. Right up up the road from me, a little piece. We stopped to see her. Of course, we haven't been in there now since the coronavirus. Right. We usually stop 
on Sundays when I, I've got her brother, Crystal's brothers, three little grand, three little children. And uh, I don't have them, I mean, but they stay with me on the weekends and go to church with me. We usually stop after church to see her. So her family is still waiting for answers. Oh, yes. I'm 85, and I don't expect to be here too long. Well, thank you, Lorella, for talking with us today. You're welcome, and I sure hope something happens. So if you have any information at all about what happened to Crystal Marler, who may be responsible, who may know something, anything at all, please call the McCreary County Sheriff's Office at 606-376-2322 and more cowbell. If you'd like to support the podcast, go to patreon.com forward slash just the tipsters.